Our next session, uh, which will be followed by a short break, uh, is our audience research landscape of a pandemic uh, session. We're all aware uh, that COVID-19 has, has affected every aspect of our lives. But how has lockdown impacted on audience engagement across the creative industries? We are going to hear uh, from six experts who talk through their findings, um, including how much more educated uh, people are about technology as a result um, of, of the global pandemic, how schools have actually uh, become so much more engaged uh, and using online learning as a, as a tool for education, and how we really feel about live streams. and welcome to Beyond 2020. I'm Professor Chris Speed from the University of Edinburgh and I lead a centre called the Institute of Digital Art and Technology. And um, well, we actually own one of the creative clusters. So Creative Informatics is based in Edinburgh and we address the questions around the potential for the creative industries to make the most of data-driven innovation. And uh, we've been running for two years and have a lot of impact an understanding about what is making a difference, particularly in the concepts of data literacy and helping push on new work with AI, natural language processing, so on and so forth. But more about this particular session. 2020 has been and still is an extremely strange time. Ever since the initial announcement of lockdown in March, then coming out of lockdown in June, and then back in again now, it's a disconcerting and confusing for an individual. Um, but equally so as a society and, of course, the impact on the sector. To help to try to see through this confusion, Beyond is focusing on the opportunities. What can we learn from the recent disruption and how can we build back better? So the first place to start is to find out what we've learned. The first day of this year's conference is all about divergence, how the pandemic has forced us to step away from the patterns of our previous practice, previous platforms, processes and priorities and look for new paths through the disruption. We wanted this session to be an overview of what we've learned so far, an assessment of the impact that the, that the pandemic has had on audiences and on audience engagement and behavior. First, as a broad sector, trying to identify what are the common themes? Where are the differences in experience between different and specific sectors? but then to also give people the chance to drill down into the detail in the areas that most closely fit their own practice, to find out more about the trends that could shape their own creative practice, their academic research or business planning. To that end, we've collated a spread of expertise from across the creative industries, asking them all of the same of the following three key questions to try to tease out the patterns. So number one, tell us three key statistics that you've discovered about your audiences during lockdown? Number two, which of these do you think is the most significant and why? Three, what changes do you expect to see over the next 12 months? Predictably, given the impact of social distancing on any live co-located events, performances and visitor experiences, they've all been within different sectors most obviously hit by lockdown. And our first speaker, Johnny Freeman from i2media at Goldsmiths, 
is an expert in media psychology and human factors of digital media, who, with Nesta, has been working on the audience of the future performance demonstrator. With the advent of the pandemic, I2 Media and Nesta extended their work on audience segmentation to look at the impact of the lockdown on audiences. I'm Professor Johnny Freeman, and I'm Managing Director of I2 Media Research Limited, a spin-off company from Goldsmiths University of London that I founded in 2002. I'm also Professor of Psychology at Goldsmiths University of London and Goldsmiths Academic Lead for Knowledge Exchange. My team are part of the Audience of the Future performance demonstrator led by Royal Shakespeare Company, exploring the future of live performance in the digital space. We had amazing plans for a location-based experience this midsummer just gone, and unfortunately that had to be cancelled because of COVID. So the project needed an evidence base on which to form its strategy to pivot to digital-only distribution. To develop this evidence base, we did a nationally representative survey on the YouGov panel to over 2,000 UK households. We were asking people how they were feeling during lockdown, what they were missing during lockdown, and what devices and technologies they have at home to access digital content. Top findings from the research were really important for the sector, and we want to share them with you in depth in the breakout session later. First thing to note is that audiences told us they're really missing live performance. They're missing the jeopardy of the experience. They're also missing the sense of being together with other audience members and the performers. Another key stat that came out of our research was that very few UK households have access to immersive VR headsets at home. It's around 5% of households. That's a real challenge if we're trying to deliver compelling, engaging, immersive experiences to audiences at home. But there is hope. The hope is from the third key finding that we observed, which is that audiences across the spectrum, even those who previously weren't so digitally literate, are much more comfortable with digital technology as a result of lockdown. In fact, much more reliant on these technologies. What that means is there's a massive opportunity with the creative and cultural sector. Obviously, COVID has wreaked havoc and caused carnage in the sector, but we can view this as an opportunity to reach bigger audiences, new audiences, with compelling and engaging digital content at home. To reach these audiences, we need an in-depth understanding of who they are. And that's one of the key points of our research, which we'll share in the Q&A. To understand different types of audiences and their motivations, we created a new segmentation of audiences for creative and cultural content at home. I'm gonna talk more about this segmentation in the Q&A with my colleagues, but I'm just showing it you here to show that we can map out the segments dependent on their arts and cultural engagement and their technology literacy. Given that we've seen that audiences are more comfortable experiencing digital content at home, we see that this is gonna be a developing trend. We also know that unfortunately lockdowns are probably gonna be a feature of, of most of our lives over the coming months as well. So we see the key trend over the next 12 months being that creative and cultural organisations address the demand that audiences have for really great content at home. Hopefully these little highlights will have piqued your interest. Really want to see you at our live Q&A later on. Next we have Neelay Patel from Digital Theatre, a leading channel for online access to live theatre through their twin platforms which is Digital Theatre for the domestic market and Digital Theatre Plus for the educational institutions, which between them support unlimited access to over 100 productions from world leading companies and provide live theatre to over 3 million students at over 2000 institutions around the world. Hi, I'm Neelay Patel, Chief Executive of Digital Theatre. And Digital Theatre is an online learning platform that focuses entirely on the performing arts and the English language arts end of the curriculum. We have approximately 4 million students across 95 countries that have access to our platform currently. And I'm here today to talk to you about a couple of the observations that we made over the last nine months, particularly in the context of the school shutdowns around the world brought on by the COVID pandemic. So the first of which was that we saw pretty much overnight, mid-March and continuously up until now, 
um, and we expect it to continue, um, was a 300% increase of usage on a per school basis of our platform. So every school on average increased its usage of our platform by approximately 3x. And this really spoke and speaks to just how adaptive the schools, the teachers, the students are to um, the change that's been thrust upon them. The second observation we made was um, that we've made is really at that secondary school level, so or high schools in North America. Now we've seen an explosion of uptake of DT of Digital Theatre Plus um, across the secondary school market. But what we saw in particular, which is quite interesting, was that um, the UK secondary schools adopted Digital Theatre Plus in absolute terms at a rate 21% higher than that of the US. And that's really interesting if you consider that the US has over half of the world's English speaking secondary school market in it. Um, and that really just says that, you know, the UK has disproportionately advanced its move into technology based learning and teaching um, uh, by a very large margin. And then the third observation we saw was at the higher education level. So again, we saw explosive growth with two year, four year colleges, universities around the world. Uh, but what we saw there was the opposite of what we saw with the secondary school market and that, that the US uh, higher education sector adopted digital theater plus at a three to one ratio that of the UK. And I think that's really showing us that they are fundamentally rethinking the student value exchange, student learning experience. And up to this point, they've just been a far more bold, bolder uh, level of thinking, um, a level of experimentation that, than their counterparts in the UK. That's what we're seeing currently. Now, the most significant element of all of this is that despite all the shutdowns, despite the tighter operating budgets, despite an instinct to maybe focus limited resources on teaching STEM-based subjects, is that there's been a continued appreciation um, and, and subsequent investment into teaching the performing arts. Um, you know, there's just an understanding of the value of the creative arts that hasn't waned in the slightest. In fact, it appears to be increasing. Um, with that, um, I hope you enjoyed the Beyond Conference. Um, I hope that was interesting. My name is Neelay Patel. Take care. Although Neelay makes it clear how seriously the education market has taken the pandemic and the need for a significant investment in response, he'll be joining Johnny and his research colleagues, Leah Curta from I2 Media and Fran Sanderson from Nesta in the Performance Breakout Group. And we'll be able to talk about the impact the pandemic has also had on domestic audiences. G. Davey is Head of Legal and Business at the Association of Independent Music, the non-for-profit trade body representing the UK's independent music sector. Hello, I'm G. Davey and I'm the Head of Legal and Business Affairs at the Association of Independent Music, also known as AIM. AIM is the trade body exclusively representing the entrepreneurial independent music sector, which currently makes up around a quarter of the recorded music market uh, though our members engage in activities across many music business areas. For this presentation, I've drawn together some publicly announced statistics from across the music sector, which I felt gave a broad picture of the behaviour of music audiences and the market as affected by COVID and the resulting lockdowns. Statistic one, 85% of live stream viewers say live streams or videos can't replace the live experience. Statistic two, Global music streaming subscriptions spiked 35% year on year in the first quarter of 2020 to reach 394 million subscriptions. Statistic three, Love Record Stores Day boosts music retail, taking over a million pounds in revenue. Okay, I know that's not a statistic, but it was such a good news story in the middle of lockdown 1.0, I couldn't resist including it here. How about this instead? Physical retail sales dropped 50% in the first week of the first lockdown, but are now projected to hit or exceed 2019 levels for some independent retailers. The thing that all these three statistics have in common is that together they demonstrate that there's a resilient and stable audience for music. Under lockdown, this audience was seeking out music, whether via online retail, live stream or standard streaming services. Not only that, but during a time of great uncertainty, it seems people were more than happy to pay for music. The most significant of these three statistics is probably the one relating to live streaming. With live events impossible, there was an almost instantaneous transition towards live stream gigs in a range of styles and in varying quality. Here's a visual of what this sudden change looked like from Twitch's tracker service. 
The Live Nation statistic, although on the surface a demonstration that the vast majority of live music fans will return to venues once they reopen, conversely suggests that there are a not insignificant number who won't. Certainly the proliferation of new live streaming platforms suggests that it's a phenomenon that's likely to continue as a much more significant part of music consumption into the future. So as the live streaming statistics suggests, as venues reopen, we will likely see at least some return to live events and festivals over the next 12 months. But I'm also certain that live streaming in its current form will continue, and I expect there'll also be more hybrid events, which maximise reach as well as retaining fan bases. The way we pay for content is also changing, with digital ticketed live streams already becoming usual, along with virtual gifts and tipping. And I expect growth in payment for premium access to artists, such as being able to request which songs will feature on a release or having the artist name check a fan during the performance. In-game tours and virtual reality album releases are also on the rise, not just Travis Scott's now infamous event within the game Fortnite, but there's also been gigs in Minecraft. And my favorite example so far, independent musician Phoebe Bridges gigging in the fantastically cute game Animal Crossing, complete with a penguin on drums. I expect to see more of these over the next 12 months. Wow, some great insights. And we can already see that there's some key themes are emerging across the speakers so far. First, that people are very willing to use digital to access creative content at home, both theatre and music, and both domestic and for schools. Second, people are really missing the experience of live performance. However quickly they may have accepted the move to digital, this obviously doesn't recreate the experience entirely. And even though Johnny doesn't highlight this, I know from the interesting session he did at the Creative Coalition the other week that one of the key points he'll be taking about this into the breakout session is audience feelings, the emotions, such as anxiety and uncertainty that the pandemic has provoked in us, and the fundamental importance for each of us and the sector of social interaction. Thirdly, lockdown has seen new audience segments, demographics, who are all becoming more and more comfortable with the digital as a channel for accessing content and for engaging with new content on new platforms. And finally, there are emergent new ways of generating revenue in music. And those joining the performance discussion group after this will probably find that there are similar trends going on there. Similarly, we can see that a key prediction in common seems to be that even though there will be an inevitable return to live events with any vaccine and a reduced need for social distancing, it does seem likely that now audiences have successfully engaged with accessing performances through digital channels, that this will continue to be a persistent feature going forward. We now have Anne Torrigiani, whose work with audience agencies spans the spread of visitor experience from libraries and museum collections, through galleries to heritage and beyond, and who, in her role as co-director of the Centre for Cultural Value at Leeds, is leading a UK RI and AHRC funded longitudinal study into the impacts of COVID-19 on the cultural sector across the UK. Hi, I'm Anne Torijani. I'm the CEO of the Audience Agency, the national charity for arts and museums engagement and participation. I am also the co-director of the new Centre for Cultural Value, the new research centre based at the University of Leeds. And in both capacities, I believe I'm going to be, I'm very much looking forward to coming and talking at the Beyond 2020 conference. So uh, the Audience Agency is the custodian of the Audience Finder national data sets. Uh, we think it's one of the biggest um, data sets of cultural, cultural consumers anywhere in the world. And one of the things we've been doing during lockdown is, of course, looking at who is missing from the audience finder data sets. But we've been doing much more than that as well. We've been trying to explain some of those gaps by doing a whole load of uh, rather particular COVID related uh, research and um, exploration, should we say. So one of them has been an intention survey looking at audience behaviours, particularly in and around Scotland. Uh, we've also been doing really fascinatingly a whole piece of surveying around audiences and consumers of digital content. Uh, obviously very, very interesting at the moment as everybody's changing what they're doing and how they're doing it. And perhaps most significantly of all, we've just embarked on the Audience Agency COVID Monitor, which is a longitudinal population survey looking at what um, a, a very sort of standardised sample across the whole of the UK population is doing in terms of cultural engagement. And I think that's going to really give us an idea about who the haves and the have nots are, uh, particularly going forward as we, you know, we our, our, our concerns increasingly that lots of people might be excluded from 
uh, creative and, and cultural participation um, as they rise to the top. I think that's going to give us some really useful clues for what we can do about it. To say, I think there are lots of interesting things coming out of all of them, and I'm very much looking forward to sharing them. But I will say that uh, number one on my list is the fact that all, all older and younger audiences seem to have very different expectations and hopes for what their digital cultural experience is going to be like. And I think that creates certain challenges for us. The second one is that uh, digital really has reached some audiences that other forms and formats haven't reached, but who? And the third one is that there are significant and to me perhaps quite surprising reasons why people are valuing the online offer, this great explosion of new stuff that's available to them. Um, the reason, there, are three, there are a number of different reasons why they really value it and they seem to value some things more than others and as I say some of those are to me at least a little bit surprising. Now if you want to find out what they are and about what the changes that I think we need to make in how we serve up um, our new sort of dollop of lovely and um, delicious uh, cultural and arts and museums activity um, in future, um, do please join me at Beyond 2020 conference. Very much looking forward to seeing you there. Bye bye. Intriguing. And, but this consideration of the segmentation with the audience echoes exactly what Johnny, Leah and Fran have been finding in their work on audience segmentation within performance. Definitely a study to follow as it moves forward. With well-established channels for asynchronous and remote delivery, games and TV broadcast have been relatively protected compared to performance and visitor experience. However, as we've just heard, within these, one of the key elements of esports, the big international live events, were largely cancelled and caused significant knock-on impacts. We now have Luca Chiavato from New Zoo, one of the world's most trusted and quoted sources for games, market insights and analytics, to tell us more. Hello everyone, I'm Luca Chivato and I'm a market analyst at Nuzu, the leading provider of games and esports analytics. A big part of my job is staying up to date on everything related to esports and game viewership on live streaming platforms. Alongside with the market analyst sim, we then use our findings to provide our clients with actionable insights on the industry. Today, I am walking you through some of the most interesting esports and live viewership statistics that we have recorded during this crazy, crazy 2020. While some of you might, might have read some articles about how esports must be booming uh, with, the same, with the same at home orders, um, it's really more of a mixed bag. You see, um, well, 2020 has been a stellar year for live streaming, uh, which is the main broadcast medium for esports. In the first 10 months, uh, Twitch and YouTube Live recorded a staggering 70% increase in hours watch compared to 2019. That said, this hasn't inherently converted into increased esports performance because uh, the main driver of esports viewership is the big global events that happen on live stages. But of course, because of the pandemic, over 70% of major live esports events have been postponed, moved to online or straight away canceled. Um, it is worth noting, however, that the pandemic has not slowed down the, the rate of audience acquisition. In fact, while the supply of esports live content dropped by a quarter, the esports that were watched only dropped by 1%. Uh, this means that people are still interested in watching, they just didn't have the chance to do so because many of the key tournaments that happen that make up the eSports calendar are, are just not happening. You see, as you might know, many eSports uh, biggest ecosystems such as Dota and Counter-Strike are driven heavily by top tier major majors that are focused on international competitions, which requires the top teams to fly from every region and coming together to play for the title. With the restrictions applying and the competitive integrity problems caused by playing on an online setting, organizing live events has been a nightmare. The lack of high-profile tournaments has, in many ways, offset the gains from more people watching, from more people staying at home watching esports. In fact, the absence of such events caused some of the esports revenue stream, like merchandise and ticket revenues, to go into decline for the first time. However, the good news is that esports is still fundamentally strong and, and exceptionally resilient. Uh, we predict its size will still grow during this year, although only by 1.7%, and its audience is close, closing in on the half million figure. As the pandemic will, as we all hope, uh, progressively fade out over 2021, it will be possible to host live events again, and the industry will be back on the upward trend on which it was before all hell broke loose. Thank you for tuning in, and I'm looking forward to receiving any questions. 
So slightly complicated by the loss of the big live events, but even so, the 70% year-on-year increase in the amount of hours streamed echoes the increased audience for digital content during the pandemic. We now have Luca's colleague at News U, Jeremy Jackson, to talk more specifically about the impact of the pandemic on games audiences. Hello, everybody. My name is Jeremy Jackson. I'm a market analyst over at Nuzu. Nuzu is a data analytics company focused on games, esports, and mobile. At Nuzu, I assist the market analyst team in developing insights for those sectors, as well as helping brands define their strategies when it comes to gaming and esports. Today, we're going to be looking at how the COVID-19 pandemic affected the video games industry and overall the video games industry has benefited by the fact that they've done quite well. Uh, we've seen many trends accelerate uh, during these lockdowns and we'll be going into some of those today. Now, three interesting statistics that we discovered is that one, gamers are spending more money. Uh, we saw $15.6 billion added on top of our initial forecast for 2020. That's a 20% year over year growth. Two, People are playing as a means to socialize. With distancing in place, uh, we saw 17% of uh, gamers surveyed in key markets respond that they had been playing more games as a means to socialize. Uh, and three, uh, we've seen players become more engaged. The average daily playtime increased by an average of 3.3 minutes for the top titles in March. That's month over month. So let's focus really on the uh, way that people have been using games to socialize. First, we saw lots of people taking typically social offline ov events online. Uh, this means that they were taking things like weddings or talk shows into game spaces such as Animal Crossing. We also saw concerts uh, by top celebrities such as Travis Scott be hosted within games like uh, Fortnite and achieve really high engagement levels. Brands quickly took note of this and we saw things like launch trailers taking place within Fortnite as well um, and political rallies, protests and other social events uh, geared in more of a marketing sense taking place within those same game spaces. Finally, we also saw an increase in kind of professional events taking place in the virtual world such as this Facebook event which took place within uh, the virtual reality space. And what does this mean for the next 12 months? Well, we'll likely see games as social platforms continue to develop. Uh, this was a trend before, uh, and it's really, really been aggressively accelerated during COVID-19. Um, games like Fortnite are really doubling down on the social aspect they have with things like Fortnite Party, and we're seeing a lot of social game contenders popping up uh, around that space. Next, we'll see digital sales continue to eclipse physical sales. This was really um, a quickly a well-developed trend already, uh, but with the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, next generation consoles, which feature digital only additions, uh, we'll be seeing this trend accelerate. Uh, and finally, we'll be discovering if the new gamers who have kind of joined the industry in the past seven or eight months will be staying around long-term. Anyway, thank you so much for joining. So once again, a continuation acceleration of the underlying trends and wider platforms across the sector with increased uptake of digital content as our physical activities were restricted and the increased use of technology to support socialization as we try to deal with the feelings of anxiety, uncertainty, boredom that Johnny's research flagged. Overall, we can see while production has certainly been impacted across the board, delivery of games and esports, along with TV, video and film, have all been relatively more shielded than performance and visitor experiences by their inherently remote delivery models. However, within TV, video and film, there are some interesting parallels. For example, the survey by the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre, cultural consumption in the UK during COVID-19 lockdown, showed that lockdown had negatively affected people's experience of their mental well-being. But that the survey respondents had felt that all content, but especially music, had helped, with 90% saying that music had been particularly helpful. This was reflected by a market increase in streaming of digital content in all formats. TV, film, music, games, e-publishing, and a willingness to explore new, less familiar areas of online content, such as theatre, dance, and art and photography. Looking specifically at TV, in addition to the marked upswing in subscriptions to video on demand services, such as Netflix and Disney+, Noted in the Ofcom Media Nations report in August 2020, 
there also appears to have been an equally dramatic return to linear TV watching, with broadcasters such as the BBC reporting that viewers were watching 44% more linear channels compared to with this time last year, younger viewers as much as 67%, and Channel 4 similarly reporting that all-day linear viewing among their key 16 to 35 demographic was up 29%. However, it should be noted that any increase in online viewing needs to be seen in the context of Ofcom's other observation, made in their 2020 communications market report in September, that while more than half of the UK households now have a smart TV, almost two thirds of households now have their TV connected to the internet in some way, but 13% of UK households are still not online. And the Creative Industries Policy and Evidence Centre's observation that the digital cultural class divide that existed before lockdown may have widened further, with increased consumption increased more slowly for people in lower social economic groups and those who have stopped working compared to those who were largely working from home already. Is this a K-shaped media recovery to match the much discussed K-shaped economic recovery? Food for thought and something we may not be able to fully answer for some time. Finally, I just want to say thank you to all our speakers and invite you to join them in the breakout groups to find out more about the trends in your sector and do enjoy Beyond 2020.